Leon Weinberg is the name. I was born in Poland in 1925. That made me, I was 13 years old when the war broke out. Well, my life in Poland before the war was, I guess, was as normal as anybody uh, could picture a young Jewish boy from a middle income family uh, growing up in big city. I was born in Lodz, which was one of the biggest city in, in Poland. I went to a uh, Hebrew school, which is a, uh, not a cheder, Hebrew school. Uh, and when the war broke out, I was just about finished with my public Hebrew school and ready to go on to gymnasium, which is high school, as I'm sure you know. My family was my father, mother, an older sister and a younger sister plus a very large, larger family, like aunts, uncles, which I, I would guess they amounted to about maybe 200 people or maybe more. And uh, the uh, happy memories, there were some school uh, kids. I was involved in a lot of sports activities, belonging to a sports club and uh, playing table tennis, soccer, like any other normal, I would say, uh, teenager. And I remember exactly the day when the Polish army was leaving the city, and the following day the Germans walked in, marched in. I don't know. I, in fact, at that time, as kids, we stood on the streets, we watched them come in, not knowing what to expect. And they looked to me like, like Roman gladiators with the, with the panzer trucks, with the, with the tanks marching to the city. But the, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't fear at that time. It was just uncertainty. We didn't know what to expect. And... It was always that feeling, God will give, something will happen. Well, nothing wrong will, not, nothing is going to happen to us. And uh, just the first few days of them in the city of Rycombe from a lodge were just about quiet. Well, we found out that the ghetto is going to be formed in the city of Lodz, which was that time, the name was changed to Litzmannstadt the German name for Lodz. Uh, we were few of the lucky ones because the part of the town where I lived in was, was going to be the part of the ghetto. So we didn't have to leave our apartment. Uh, so we just stayed where we are. Only thing we had to congest a little bit because in about one week, that whole part of town swelled from a population, that part of the city, from a population of probably maybe 40 or 50,000 people to about 300,000. And plus, every day, all night, people were brought in from the outskirts of Lodge too. To know exactly how many people there were, I don't remember. They would uh, uh, schlep the uh, little wagons, two-wheel wagons, with all the belongings, whatever they could save. And... Uh, uh, how they settled them, what happened to them, I, I don't even know. I know they, they slept in, in schools and factories, whatever they could, they could push them in. That's where the life in ghetto started. Where I, spent, I spent four years in the Lodge ghetto. And the only way in or out was only for... Uh, official people bringing in the little food we used to get from the outside. And uh, it took a few, more, oh, just a few months, and we were organized in a little, uh, small, self-ruling 
government with Jewish policemen, Jewish president. Uh, I don't know. It was it was a a, a government run by Jews, but naturally overlooked by the Germans. Uh, they formed a government of 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 Jews, and the head of the government was. They called him, uh, his name was Rumkowski. He happened to be a, uh, a uh, before the war, as I, as I was told, I never knew of him. So we worked in factories uh, producing uh, clothing for the German army, uh, shoes for them. Food was given to you by ration card, naturally. And naturally, the food ration started to get smaller and smaller. Now, I don't know if I could ever, thinking back, what the type of, or the amount of food we were getting was unthinkable of now, because it got to a point, and to the, to the, uh, a year later, where we would live on uh, about eight ounces of bread a day. There was no butter, it was margarine and a couple ounces of sugar. Uh, like meat, maybe uh, oh, uh, a couple ounces of meat a, uh, a month. It was starvation. It got to, I think in 1940, in the Logia ghetto, people were dying at the rate, I don't have the exact figures, but there was no more the, there were no more funerals. At the beginning, we had a funeral. If someone died, there was a real Jewish funeral. But it got to a point afterwards where people were taking away in the, in the funeral carts with the horse and wagon, actually, 10, 12, and one, and one wagon piled up on top. At that time, I... The only thought in them days was hunger. You woke up in the morning hungry, and you went to sleep hungry. Now, I don't know if too many people realize that when you are hungry, there is nothing else in the world which matters. I was hungry for four years. I never had my belly full in four years. So I don't think any thought, there's nothing else when you're hungry, you, you, it gets to a point where you don't mind stealing from your own sister, from your own father. There were, there were families, good people, friends of mine, ourselves, where everybody would get their ration of bread. Now this is how people are get to be after, after being hungry and being, how do you say, they're being degraded, brought to a point where they have no more uh, self-respect. I would get up in the middle of the night and slice a piece of bread off my sister's ration. Now, I, you would never picture me, and I can't even imagine myself doing that now, but that happened. Parents, my parents will never do that to me, but as kids, we would try to steal steal in a way or not thinking the harm it will do. But I don't know. I, I don't even remember the feeling. It was just that there was just nothing else in your mind is but hungry. Now, I, I, I often thought that this got to be a way of really getting people to hate each other, breaking up families or breaking up or breaking down the morale of people with not feeding them. And no matter what we try to do, it was always one thought: going home hungry, going out, go, getting up in the morning hungry, and it, it's fine. You know, I, I can't even think. That's the only thing I do. You think of is, is food. Well, I stayed in the ghetto, like I was saying. The 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 uh, the uh, labor camp started coming in. The labor commandos. Uh, I did all kind of work in the ghetto. I was working at. Uh, and and uh, on, on buildings, I was working as a uh, as a uh, taking uh, buildings down. I was working cleaning out toilets. I was working, uh, you name it, 
I did all, any kind of work. And for some reason, I was left in the ghetto. I guess I was lucky at that point, or because I'm still alive now, uh, until 1944. At that time, there were camps already. We didn't, in fact, when people were going out, out of the ghetto with transport, like 1,000 or 2,000 people at a time, and that, was, that probably was the worst, the worst period of my life is the way we were taken out of the ghetto to work. The way it happened, it would happen any time of the day, the middle of the night or, or in the daytime. And the Sonder commander, what they called Gestapo, would come in, a few officers with a couple of dogs, and they would come in Europe, as you know, the courtyards. They would come in the courtyard and blow the whistle. And everyone in that house in that apartment has to come down to the to the to the yard and that would be a selection then and naturally everyone I remember my mother uh, she put a lot of makeup on herself to make herself look good young because they would pick people you never knew who they're gonna pick if the young ones the good-looking ones the healthy ones the the sick ones so you just took a chance and they would just pick and every day they would pick a few people on the truck and they would disappear. Never heard of them, never knew what happened. Rumors were they were taken to either Treblinka, Auschwitz. We didn't know about Auschwitz. I myself didn't know the first thing about Auschwitz. In fact, I didn't know nothing what was going on outside of the ghetto. No news could come into the ghetto. Uh, to go on uh, everyday life in the ghetto, it would be, I probably could stay here for, for 24 hours and about little incidents, what's, what was happening. Uh, but the ghetto life was the only, uh, with all the hungry, I, I was saying all the hunger and all the, 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 uh, the uh, you know, uh, stealing, because stealing was the, the, to survive you had to steal. It got to a point, like I said, you had to steal from your own. You're not, you're not thinking you're doing wrong because you always made excuses. Oh, maybe I'm young. I, I, you know, it won't hurt my parents if I steal a piece of bread from them. And after a while, you know, it got, it got, even it, it bothered you. And and uh, plain times, I, I, I would just say, it, it wasn't to a point where I, I would hurt them. I don't mean I stole from them that I, that I, uh, you know, I made them starve. But it's, I thought that a slice of bread or a slice of butter would, won't hurt them, but it make me feel better. You ask me how it happened now, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't honestly say why I did it. Though I love my parents and I, and I probably, just a thought that they ever going to disappear or die or be killed, scared me. Any time where the Gestapo would come and pick people, I always hoped nobody, I hoped nobody from my family would be taken away. And for some reason, until 1944, we escaped every uh, Aussiedlung, they called it. In fact, I was the first one to be taken away from my family. When I left the ghetto, the way it happened, in fact, let me track back. In 1942 was the worst time in the ghetto as far as Aussie Long. At that time, we had a, a children's hospital in, in, across the street from us where we lived. And I seen young infants just born being thrown out of the windows on trucks. And every morning you find out this one was taken away, this one left the ghetto, not left, I mean was taken away, this one died. And the family I've had, uh, I mean, it was a big family, a lot of uncles and aunts and cousins. It was getting smaller and smaller. In 1944, I think it was in March, uh, there was a knock at our door. They came looking for me. Why? Uh, it was just picked at random. I was still young, healthy to be taken to a labor camp. And that's the last time I seen my parents in my, uh, 
my sisters. Uh, I was scared, but never thought of, 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 of being killed. Or I've, I, until that time, I, I did not know about any uh, crematoriums. I didn't know about Auschwitz. I didn't know. I was taken with a group of about, I think it was 700 people to, to the town of uh, Częstochow which was about, uh, oh, I would say about 60, 70 miles away from uh, Lodz. And uh, there I was put to work in a building a, uh, a German factory. The Germans evacuated the whole factory naturally with us, and we were put all of us. Uh, there was that group I was with was about 350. We were put on a cattle train and sent to Germany. Now that must have been probably the worst trip in my life or the worst experience I've ever had. We spent seven days and seven nights in a cattle train. There was 80 people in one in one uh, in one uh, wagon. We took out at least 10 guys dead in that seven days traveling. We stopped, we went from Częstochow, Poland. The whole trip didn't take that long, but we were left on the railroad tracks and the side tracks for all days. They were just pushing us back and forth. And seven days later, we arrived in Buchenwald. All we could see is from the little windows look out there. Standing up, no out to relieve yourself. Everything had to be done right there, on the top of one each other. When we slept, we had to f somehow squeeze in, standing up, laying down, or just leaning on top of each other. Now that's got to be, think of it, I don't, it was a nightmare. When we got to Buchenwald, it was, it was the end of 1944. I spent I spent about two months in Buchenwald itself. And then the same people who came from that factory in Chesterhow, that all of us, the 350 of us, whatever was left from that group, were taken into a small town by Buchenwald, was called Sonnenberg, where we were put to work in a factory, but the same factory which we were building in back Poland. There were quite a few deaths every day because of starvation, of beatings. And uh, uh, the uh, only hope we had then, we started hearing rumors about the war being close to an end. That was, that was already 1945, the beginning of 1945. But after five years, from 39 till then, we didn't believe any rumors because we had rumors all along that the war is only going to last for one day, two days, two days, uh, one month, two months, three months, a year, two years, and then it dragged on. So at that time, there was just no, no, no hope. When we were taken to Sonnenberg in that uh, in that factory, we had uh, we worked there for about two months, and then where the worst probably period of our life started, what they called the March. In April of 1945, we knew that something is happening with the war, because we seen the first signs of, of the war coming to an end. We went on a march, it took us seven days. We slept in the open and rain, and, 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 and at the time it was, we had a lot of rain in, them, in, in that part of the country. We slept, and one, one night I remember they put us in in a schoolroom where they blocked off half of the room. They put 300 people in a room about the size maybe twice of here. We slept on top of each other all night. And if anyone stuck his head out, there was a German there with a, with a whip, and he would hit us in the head. Then the following night we slept in a, a barn where... A friend of mine sticking his friend of mine, say a fellow I was in camp with that time, I don't even remember his name now, stuck his head out and he was shot right there. We had to start out again. And from then on, we marched again for two weeks. 
Now to describe that much is really it's 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 impossible. We have na naturally we didn't take our clothes off. We marched, we marched, we marched for two weeks from one village into the other, and then the we started out there was uh, uh, 350 of us. I did, when when we got, when we were lib liberated, in fact, when we were liberated, there was 200 of us left. There was 150 killed or died on that march. I had I was with a friend of mine who was a very good friend of mine since childhood. We went camp together. Uh, he was very sick, and I guess I saved his life by. Uh, uh, he was ready to commit suicide, and I uh, dragged him with somebody else's help. And somehow the war ended, we were liberated, I saved him. But while at that march, which lasted for about three or three and a half weeks, we had one we had one incident going through a through a a uh, through woods. It says eleven kilometers on it, and that lieutenant hollered out loud, he says, If you don't hurry up, the last one get shot every kilometer, and sure he did that. We didn't know where we were going. We were going from one village into the other. We just, just like, like, uh, like a merry-go-round. And uh, I don't know, before we know, I hear shots and screaming, and before we know, the soldiers, the Germans are picking their hands up, and that's how we, and I see there's some American, uh, uh, Couple tanks, uh, one truck, a few American soldiers. That's how we were liberated, and it just a turn that happened just like that. I, I thought that the the joy would be tremendous. It wasn't. It was just just taken in. First thing was just get something to eat. It was a bread or whatever, and uh, you know it's such a long time. But I I don't think I was happy. I didn't dance from joy. Because I think we just, I don't think we had any feelings for dancing or, or, or joy or smiling, anything. We're just a very, very, it's, it was an existence. That's all it was. It wasn't, I don't think I, I could be happy. I don't think I, I realized what happened to me until, I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever, because too many things happened afterwards. You know, finding out that my family's all gone, or uh, getting used to what things were. I don't think I've ever been very overjoyed that I stayed alive at that time. Anyway, it was just either way. It happened. It happened. I had I had a lot. I had a, I had very bad nightmares uh, right after the war, where I. What happened after the war? When I was liberated, I went back to Poland to look for my family. So I didn't stay on in Germany. I took the first train back, and I went back to my hometown, to my old apartment, to my old house. And naturally, that was my, uh, I broke down completely. That's about the only time I broken down uh, that was after, right after the war. And uh, I spent a little time there waiting for someone to show up. I thought maybe there's someone still alive. I spent about uh, four or five months in after war in, in Poland. And then I went back to Germany. And then living in the DP camps for about three years, uh, there was a period of life where, where everything just, we tried to block everything out of our mind. It was just an unnatural existence. Like I've lived probably a double, a, 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 a life before and a life now, which is something entirely different than what we have now. And I don't think I can ever forget that. I don't think I can ever... Uh, I did try the first years, you know, after, after the war. I think I did try to erase everything during the war. And I, I fact, I, I don't think I would ever uh, sit down and talk about it. If you ask me that, uh, let's see, I came here in 1949, 30 years ago. If you had approached me, I wouldn't. I don't think I would have. And my memories were much fresher then, but I absolutely would not talk about it. But then later on, I just started feeling different. I started to, to, uh, uh, 
look back and seeing uh, that things cannot be forgotten, that you can't just uh, walk away from it, or you can't just say, this is it, uh, uh, I can't, uh, uh, don't talk about it. In fact, I was, I was even ashamed to talk about it. I always thought of someone, uh, like people say, ah, we don't want to listen about it, we don't want to hear about it, we know all we have to know about it. But uh, it's not like that. I think I, I think about it more now, maybe because I get older, uh, I'm getting mellow, to say. Think a lot about it, too much, I think.